Poland, we'll be talking about uh, extracting the ENSO cycle from observations and the birth and death of coherent sets. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Berminian, for the, for the invite, and uh, thanks all of you for turning up at this irregular time. Uh, so this is, uh, the talk's in two pieces, and the first part is concerning this uh, ENSO cycle extraction, and uh, that's joint work with uh, Dimitris Giannakis, Ben Lintner, his student Max Pike, and Joanna Slowinska. And uh, then the second part is about um, coherent sets and their, their birth and their death, and that's joint work with Peter Coltai. So I'll start with the, the ENSO material. So this is a image of uh, sea surface temperature, absolute sea surface temperature. And uh, of course you have this equatorial correlation. So you have warm water near the equator and cooler water near the poles. But there are some deviations from this. For example, you see off uh, Peru, you have this yellow cooler tongue of water and that's associated with La Nina. And uh, instead of looking at absolute temperatures, typically what you do is you look at anomalies. So if I look at the same picture at the same time, uh, this is the, the, so what you do here is you, for this week in August, you subtract the average sea surface temperature that you would encounter in that week over many, many years. So you subtract a climatological mean and this is the anomaly. And you see that indeed you have anomalous, anomalously cool water uh, off Peru. So you have the same cool tongue that was in the same position as the yellow here. And uh, this is a signature of La Nina. And uh, at this point in time, when I took the figure, uh, La Nina conditions were reasonably strong. And that's why this is here. So the, the ENSO, so ENSO stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation, and it's an oscillation between two extremes. One extreme is La Nina that I've been talking about. So that's where you have anomalously cool water uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, the other extreme is El Nino where you have uh, warmer water. And uh, you uh, approximately oscillate between these two extremes with a period of around about four years. So um, the standard way that you tell whether you're in one of these regimes or not is um, you pick, pick a box uh, like these colored boxes here. Uh, they're, they're positioned so that they're round about where that tongue uh, of warm or cool water appears. And the one I'm going to use as a comparison in this talk is the Nino 3-4 box, which is this red box. And what the standard thing you do is uh, just simply average the, the, uh, the anomalous uh, temperature spatially over this box at a point in time. And that gives you a number. And uh, from that, you get a time series. So, so down here is a time series over the last 70 years. And uh, so zero is kind of the average. And if you're uh, having high numbers, these are in degrees Celsius. So if you're about two degrees Celsius warmer than normal, then you're El Nino. And uh, conversely, uh, if you're down here, you're in La Nina conditions. Uh, a zoom of this is, uh, so I downloaded this yesterday. Uh, so this is pretty much up to date. When I took the images I just showed you, that was September, 2020. So that was around here where you were near this uh, minimum. But in the meantime, we've gone back to more neutral conditions. So now we're kind of somewhere in the middle, neutral. Okay. So uh, this is, I'm going to refer to this as the Nino 3-4 index. It's one of the standard indices that climatologists use to assess El Nino. Now, what I want to do in this talk is extract a canonical strong ENSO cycle from some observational data, namely uh, 50 years of sea surface temperature fields. And I want to do this with transfer operators. And uh, we're going to get a cycle out of this that uh, is rectified in the sense that you proceed at a uniform speed around the cycle. Okay, uh, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but this will give more detail on the, on the formation of El Nino. Uh, and thirdly, I want to demonstrate a better self-consistency or equivariance in time uh, of the cycle that we get when you compare it with this Nino 3-4 index that is the standard so far. 
Okay, so, but before we do that, I want to talk a bit about some high school dynamical systems and uh, almost invariant sets. So uh, suppose we have an autonomous flow and uh, we have, uh, we, we add some noise to this uh, deterministic flow to give us an STE, so just some Brownian motion. Uh, then we're going to get uh, from this a, a Fokker-Planck equation that tells us about the evolution of densities under this SDE. And uh, so you have your, your advective term and your diffusive term here. Now, uh, I'm going to call this, uh, this uh, right-hand side here uh, A epsilon. So it's a linear differential operator. And I'll call this uh, the generator for the SDE. And, um, so the first thing that this generator does for you is if you find uh, the eigenfunction corresponding to the eigenvalue zero, which by conservation of mass you always have, then uh, you found an invariant density of this SDE because uh, on the left-hand side, you've got partial DFDT. So if, if, uh, if A epsilon F is zero, that means there's no change in F with respect to time. So you're, you're fixed and you found some equilibrium density. Now, uh, I'm not too interested in that F, but I'm interested more in the rest of the spectrum and uh, the corresponding eigenfunctions. So uh, primarily the ones that are close to the, uh, the imaginary axis. So the spectrum of this operator is contained in the left half of the complex plane. So you have this lambda zero, everything else is to the left half of the imaginary axis. And uh, the more left, the faster that you are decaying. And uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, fitting that Michael was here because he was one of the progenitors of almost invariant sets um, and uh, a, a kind of a slight extension of, uh, of his work is uh, this work in 2013 with Oliver Junger and Peter Koltai where we looked at the uh, continuous time case and to show that um, if you look at extreme values of eigenfunctions near, uh, near uh, Sorry, what am I saying? Considering extreme values of eigenfunctions of A epsilon for eigenvalues near the, near the imaginary axis, uh, then they will tell you where almost invariant sets are. Let me show you some examples. So uh, here is a uh, flow in 3D. That's uh, the ABC, the Arnold Beltrami Childress flow. And um, what you're looking at here is the second eigenfunction of your generator. And you see that uh, there are extreme positive values in red here and extreme negative values in blue here. And if you see what they correspond to, they correspond to, in the deterministic case, these KAM tubes. Deterministically, these are invariant tubes. Uh, and when you add the small amount of Brownian motion, these become almost invariant. And we pick them up as this uh, second eigen uh, function. Here's the next eigenfunction, the next one with the next, uh, the next most, most negative uh, real part of the eigenvalue. And uh, here you see you pick up some different uh, KAM tubes. So the main message I want to get from this, I don't want to talk about the ABC flow in particular, but I just want to point out that uh, these extreme values of the eigenfunction, uh, as in the very early work of uh, Michael as well, uh, show you where almost invariant sets are in the phase space. And here is a theorem that makes this uh, even more uh, precise. So suppose that your, uh, your generator has some real eigenvalue lambda uh, with corresponding eigenfunction f. And if you define a uh, plus to be the part of the phase space where f is uh, non-negative and a minus to be the part of the phase space where f is negative. And finally, nu to be the probability measure with density absolute value f then the eigenvalue lambda is equal to the sum of the escape rates from these two sets, a plus and a minus. Uh, so what is escape rate? Escape rate means that you say, okay, my trajectory begins in a plus, and then it leaves at some point. Uh, and then I condition on the fact that I began in a plus. And I take the derivative of this with respect to time because these are trajectories of some STE. And uh, that is my escape rate. And so lambda is the sum of these two escape rates. And so uh, if your lambda is uh, real and close to zero, then this forces these two escape rates, which obviously 
non-negative uh, to be small. And since the escape rates are small, low, the sets A plus and A minus are therefore almost invariant. So this is a more quantitative way of um, stating that we have almost invariant sets. Now, uh, in this talk, I'm going to be interested in the complex lambda case. So uh, for complex lambda, uh, I'll write this as alpha plus uh, I two pi beta. Then the real and imaginary parts of your eigenfunction now span a two-dimensional real eigenspace and they precess with a period one on beta. And from these, you can get uh, coherent or almost cyclic uh, sets that are precessing with a period uh, one on beta. And this is what we aim to do for Enzo. So uh, using the sea surface temperature data, we're going to build a transfer operator and we're going to find that in fact, the, uh, the most uh, dominant non-trivial eigenfunction is, uh, a co is complex. And we're going to read off the, um, the Enzo cycle and the period from the, from the eigenvalue. Now, what we expect is that uh, beta is going to be about one quarter in inverse years because the Enzo cycle is about four years. So that's what we expect. Uh, so I thought I'd show you something a bit more familiar before I do that. So uh, let's, let's have a look at the Lorentz equations. Uh, so uh, what we did is made a transfer operator for the Lorentz attractor, uh, pretty short flow time because I want to get a, a generator eigenvalue out of it. So I, I flow for some short amount of time. I have a small, also a small amount of uh, uh, diffusion. And I'm going to use the fact that uh, the, the, the generator generates my, my transfer operator. So what I can do, which is pretty standard, is um, I can compute my second largest magnitude eigenvalue of this, of the transfer operator. I'll call that lambda, capital lambda. And then I can estimate uh, the small lambda, which is the corresponding eigenvalue for the generator A by um, inverting this expression here. Uh, so I've got one on T log, uh, log capital lambda. And what you get is numerically, what you get is what you see here. And uh, using uh, writing it in this form here, and uh, using the fact that my period is one on beta, that gives me a one on beta of about 0.77 time units. Now the, the corresponding complex eigenvector is shown uh, here in the complex plane. So this is as you proceed, this is from a single time series. So as you proceed around the time series, you go around and around the, uh, this complex eigenvector, uh, which I've normalized to have magnitude about one. This is the real part. You can see it's approximately sinusoidal. And if you look at uh, the period of this, it is about 0.77, right? I think that's, if you look at this, it's believable that the period is around 0.77 given the time scale on the x-axis. And you can project the Lorentz dynamics onto this uh, dominant cycle, which is just going around the circle by coloring the attractor by the argument of this complex eigenvector. So that is what I've done here. So I have a periodic color scale and um, yeah, this is what you get. Now uh, I'm going to, I'll show you a movie because it's maybe a little clearer what's going on. So this is, um, this is evolving that complex eigen function through one period through 0.77 time units. And you see that uh, you go through one complete cycle. So in this way, we can project the Lorentz dynamics. Of course, it's non-invertible projection, so that you lose a huge amount of information. You're projecting down to, to just a circle, dynamics on a circle, but uh, this, is a, this is how you would do it. And it's, it's consistent with what you would expect because as you know, uh, the, a lot of the motion is, is circular around the, the wings. Okay. So uh, now to the, the Enzo situation. So for the observational data, we are going to use um, uh, SST fields on a grid, on a two degree by two degree latitude longitude grid. Uh, they are from observations over this 50 year period and um, they've been reanalyzed. So the observations have tried to be corrected to correct for any um, 
uh, issues with the observations. Now, uh, the number of total number of pixels is about 5,000. And so we just uh, think of this as some 5,000 dimensional vector. And uh, at each uh, month, we have a 5,000 dimensional vector. And uh, because we have um, 50 years, that means uh, 600 months. So uh, my time series is, is length 600. I think that the ENSO cycle is around four years. So because we only have 50 years of data, what we're trying to do here is pull out a cycle uh, using only 12 approximate cycles worth of data. So it's not a huge amount of data. Uh, to improve the state estimation, so we know where we are in this cycle, uh, I'm going to make a Tarkin's delay vector, but just a single delay of 12 months. So this is one quarter of the cycle period. So anyone who knows anything about Tarkin's delay, if you, if you think you're trying to get a cycle, then this is a completely standard thing to do a single delay with one quarter of the cycle period. Uh, all right, so now we, we estimate, I'm not going into a detail here on how we estimate this apart from saying it's, it's essentially a fairly standard uh, collocation using Gaussian kernels. So we have little uh, Gaussian balls that we put around each data point and we just uh, effectively collocate and, um, and then normalize. Uh, so the spectrum that you get once you've done this, um, this log transformation I talked about earlier, looks like what you see here. So uh, this is the complex plane. You've got the imaginary axis here and everything else is, you've got the eigenvalue zero that corresponds to uh, the mean because uh, the mean is your, your stationary uh, state, if you like. And what we're interested in are these two spectral points here because they have imaginary part uh, plus minus one quarter, pretty or pretty close to one quarter. So these correspond to the, the ENSO cycle. Uh, in, the, in the paper, we have more detail about what these other things mean. So there are like uh, annual cycles, semi-annual cycles, uh, and then combinations of these with, with ENSO. Uh, okay, so now I want to do a similar thing to what I did with uh, Lorentz. So back with Lorentz, uh, I had this kind of picture. Okay, so I'm going to do a similar kind of picture. Now, uh, th here it is, this looks a bit messier, but that's because we have observational data now, uh, much shorter and much noisier. Uh, this on the left is taking the Nino 3-4 index I talked about right at the beginning of the talk. So we had that little rectangle that you averaged the temperature over. So what we do is uh, we, we plot that value here on the x-axis and then on the y-axis, we have a lagged version of that by 12 months. So we're, we're lagging by one quarter period. So we're trying to, we're doing our best to make a cycle out of that Nino 3, 4 index. And it looks pretty awful. Um, now, because this is data, we, we know when Enzo and, sorry, we know when El Nino and La Nina occurred strongly. And the red shows the periods of strong El Nino and the red shows periods of strong La Nina. Now, by definition, because these strong periods are defined uh, by uh, large and small values of the Nino 3, 4 index, it must be that these red appear to the right in this figure and that the blue appear to the left in this figure. That's, that's essentially by definition of, by current definition of what is La Nina and what is El Nino. Now in our picture, um, that's not the case. Uh, there is a phase there is an arbitrary phase. So we've rotated this figure so that um, the red does appear to the right. But once we fix that, then we have no control on where the blue appears. So the blue appears wherever it appears. It seems to appear a bit rotated around uh, to the, to the northwest uh, compared to just kind of straight west. And uh, the there's a reason for that, um, which, which I'll come to uh, very soon. So the, the reason for this is that the transition from El Nino to La Nina is faster than the other way around. So going from here over to here is rapid and going from here over to here is slower. Now in our cycle, we don't go at different speeds. We go at the same speed all the way around. So if 
if you go, if it takes less time to go from here to here, it must be that these blue appear more rotated around closer to the red. And uh, indeed they do mostly seem to be. So because we're proceeding at a, because we're rectifying, because we proceed at a constant speed, we're going to see these, these La Nina appear earlier in the cycle. And uh, that, that is what we see. So that is what I've written here. Now, um, yeah, as per the, as per the uh, almost cyclic set theory that I talked about uh, earlier, what we want to do is look at large magnitude values of the eigenfunctions, because um, these are going to correspond to strong or slowly decaying parts of the Enzo cycle. So we'll take this picture here and we're going to uh, restrict ourselves to uh, points that are not near the center, but more near the periphery. These are going to correspond to the stronger uh, parts of the Enzo cycle. So we want to make a, a simplified visualization of what the Enzo cycle looks like. And so based on what is, uh, what is recently starting to be done in, in, uh, in climate, uh, people break this up into eight phases of, of six months each. So it's a four year cycle, you break it up into eight pieces of six months. And so that's what we've done here. We took this, uh, this wedge out to the right and we colored it red, that's 45 degrees. Then we go to the next 45 degree wedge, color it uh, green and so on. For the lagged Nino 3.4 picture, I do the same thing. We do this angular um, uh, cutting into wedges and restricting to large, uh, large radius parts of the, uh, the picture. So now we can ask how good are these cycles? And we can test this by evolving uh, in this uh, eigenfunction space. So let's start with these dark green uh, points, which is a neutral part of the cycle. And as I move each figure to the right here, I'm evolving forward by six months. So I evolve this six months forward. Each of these dots here is a particular point in time. I know exactly where it goes to because I have a time series. So each of these dots, I know exactly which is its six month forward dot. Here they are and they lie uh, pretty much in the next uh, in the next wedge. If I go another six months, they lie pretty much again in the next wedge, and another six months, and so on. So they're going. You proceed from wedge to wedge to wedge, uh, reasonably well, and you also stay as a group. You don't spread all over the place. On the other hand, uh, let's do this for the Nino three four embedding. So you start again in this neutral phase. You go forward six months, and well. You don't really, you don't go over here to the next wedge, you kind of disperse up here. And then as you proceed more, things just get worse and you just scatter all over the place. So from the point of representing a cycle, uh, the embedding we have here is, is I think far superior to the embedding that you would get from the Nino 3.4 uh, single number lagged. Now, uh, we want to create a picture of SST fields as you go around a, a canonical ENSO cycle. So what we're going to do is uh, take our uh, picture that we had. Now, um, our picture looked like this. This was from, was from observations. In the paper, we, uh, we look at observations and a model. So this particular graphic is for the model, but uh, just imagine it's uh, the same as what I showed you earlier. So you have these eight wedges, they're near the periphery. Every dot here corresponds to a point in time. And at every point in time, I have a complete sea surface, sea surface temperature picture. So what I can do is if I want to compass it for this entire wedge, I can just average all the sea surface temperature pictures that correspond to all these dots. And so I do that and I get this composite mean picture for phase one, which corresponds to strong El Nino. And indeed you get this red tongue here. And you do that for every one of the eight uh, wedges. So you, this, is the, uh, this is phase two, if you like, the average for phase two, phase three, phase four, and so on. And you go, as you go around in the cycle, you start with your red tongue here, it weakens a little, it starts to go blue. By now at phase four, you're in strong La Nina. And now you start to come back, the blue weakens, transitions gradually back 
to red and, and then you're back to uh, strong El Nino. So that is what we want to do. In fact, well, what I've described is what we did. Okay, uh, here are some slightly larger pictures. Um, you can see maybe a little better here now the, the green arrows. So that is the wind field. So while we, we, we used sea surface temperature data to build our transfer operator, but uh, of course you also have measurements for things like surface wind, um, uh, rainfall, um, and other, other meteorolo meteorological um, measurements. And uh, you can, uh, in the same way, get, uh, get cycles for those. So in the same way, by averaging across wedges, you, can, you, can, um, you, you know what uh, the evolution of, say, the rainfall is around the, around the Enzo cycle. Okay, so this, this, is our, this is our canonical, this is what we say is our canonical uh, strong Enzo cycle. Okay, so in summary, uh, we could extract this strong canonical Enzo cycle from SST observations. Uh, our phases are much more cyclic in terms of um, evolving from one wedge to the next uh, in a much more cyclic way than you would get from the standard Nino 3-4 index. Uh, because we rectified the cycle, meaning we proceeded a constant speed, we get greater resolution in this uh, complicated transition from La Nina back to El Nino, so the, the formation of El Nino. And that, that is hard to characterize, so it's nice that we get a bit more uh, resolution there. Um, as I mentioned, we capture things like uh, wind speed and direction, surface air temperature, precipitation, and, um, and the, these independent measurements also match well with what you expect for ENSO events. And so for all of the above reasons, we argue that the phases we've constructed in this way are superior canonical ways of characterizing the ENSO cycle. Okay, so that is the end of uh, part one. And um, now uh, not, well, maybe not something completely different, but something uh, somewhat different. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the, the birth and death of, of coherent sets. So for those of you that, um, uh, not familiar with this concept of a coherent set. Uh, what I'm showing you is a flow um, in the North Atlantic, about 50,000 particles. Uh, the velocity field is generated from satellite altimetry and um, the flow is for 90 days. Now, uh, the red here are indicating ocean eddies and uh, there is complicated motion, I think you can probably see in the background. Um, but uh, these red objects, these eddies, uh, they just uh, kind of move around and they don't uh, interact with the complicated background dynamics. So in this movie, particles are colored a particular color and that color doesn't change throughout the movie. So it's, it's, it's really these points and these eddies are just staying inside the eddy. So these eddies are examples of coherent sets, and you can think of them as, just, uh, as the predictable backbone of non-autonomous dynamical systems, because these are relatively easy to predict uh, in terms of you know, sensitive dependence on initial conditions and so forth compared to the, the complicated background. And you can find these from singular vectors of transfer operators or, or eigenvectors of the dynamic Laplacian, which I'll talk about now. Uh, okay, so now, I mean, there are several ways you can, you can find these, but they all depend on the time window. And as I mentioned, the time window here was 90 days. Okay. Now, uh, the window should be long enough so that there's sufficiently complicated dynamics to distinguish the coherent behavior from the incoherent behavior. If the flow time is too short, then everything looks coherent. So you need a long enough flow time to make this separation. But uh, the flow time should be short enough that there's consistent coherent behavior over the whole window. If, for example, I ran this for a whole year, then it might be that there are no, all the eddies uh, dissipate over one year and I wouldn't find anything. So you can't choose a very long flow time because you might eliminate all the coherent behavior. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, coherent sets and in fact, all types of Lagrangian coherent structures they're all implicitly functions of the time window, okay? Although that's not really uh, explicitly stated often, but it's always there in the background. So, um, okay, despite this adjective coherent, in fact, uh, coherent sets in LCS uh, in general 
are ephemeral. They, if we take the Ocean Eddy example, they have lifetimes from less than a month to more than three years. But uh, these three year, these very long lived eddies are not very abundant and the, the, their abundance is decaying exponentially with, with lifetime. So it's just simply in the nature of coherent sets to form, exist for a while and then decay and die. So how do you determine the timing of the birth and death of coherent sets? You could try uh, trial and error. You could have many, many, many uh, windows randomly sampled or systematically sampled. And in fact, there is some recent work uh, that does this kind of thing. But um, well, uh, we want to be a bit more, uh, I don't know. Uh, we want to do something else. We want to, do, want to be a bit more clever perhaps. So, uh, the, the approach we're going to use is to take a wide uh, time window. And within this window, all the action is going to happen. The, the, the sets are going to be born, they, they're going to live and they're dying. Now, if, if we have this very nice situation where we have a coherent set that lasts all, the time, all that time from zero to tau, then you can use these standard methods to compute coherent sets. And what you'll get as output is some family of sets parameterized by time. And they will, this will represent the location of a particular coherent set at time t. So this is a time parameterized family of sets. And this family is material or equivariant in the sense that if you take the set at time zero and you push it forward with your flow map uh, by, by t time units, then you get uh, exactly the t uh, set, so the set at time t. Okay, so I'll call this equivariance or materiality. And in the, in the movie at the bottom, these red sets are, are the coherent sets in this flow, and they are evolving uh, consistently under the advection of the flow. So they're an example of this equivariant family that I'm talking about. Okay, so now we imagine the situation where there is no coherent set over the full time interval, but there are sets that are coherent for some subinterval. And uh, we're going to deliberately relax the, uh, this materiality or equivariance property in a particular way so that a set can appear at some time, evolve in a close to material way, and then disappear. And it's this appearance and disappearance that will be the major violation of this materiality property. Okay, so my setup, uh, I, so I have some vector field, the time dependent. Um, for simplicity, to keep the formulae small, uh, I'm going to assume this is divergence free. My uh, domain is some full dimensional connected compact submanifold of RD. That's going to be the phase space of time zero. And my flow map, um, while I write it as just phi t, it's really time dependent. I'm just suppressing the fact I start at time zero to avoid notation. <clears throat> and um, yeah, later I'm going to talk about mt, which is phi t of m. So that'll be the future evolved uh, manifold. Okay, now, uh, so uh, some background here on the dynamic Laplacian. So this is a crash course in the dynamic Laplacian. So in this divergence-free setting, then there's, there's an object called the dynamic Laplacian. Um, here's its formula. Well, there are several formulae. Let me go through these. So this is, this is a differential operator on L2M, so functions on your manifold at time zero. So uh, let's forget the integration and just look at what's happening here. So you, imagine we stick in some F here. So first you apply phi minus T. So what that does is that pushes forward your F with the transfer operator to future, to time T. And in the future, you apply the usual Laplace operator on the future manifold to that function. That gives you another function on the future manifold. And you then apply phi t, which is the pullback with the coupon operator to the original uh, time zero manifold. So in the end, doing all this, you end up with a function on m. And what you're doing here is just averaging a bunch of operators, all of which are operators on functions of m. Now, uh, to, to make this even, to emphasize this, uh, you can write uh, this as the Laplace Beltrami operator with respect to the pullback of the Euclidean metric on the manifold, on the future manifold. So you have Euclidean on the future manifold, you pull it back with phi t star. This whole thing now is a metric on M 
And uh, well, this is obvious in the past, but Ultramia is not bred on functions on M. And just to make this even smaller, I'm going to call this uh, GT. Okay, so GT is this pullback. Now the, the local coordinate representation of GT is just the Cauchy Green tensor. So this tells you about uh, locally, linearly, the distortion that functions undergo when pushed forward T time units. And this distortion is captured in this Laplace Beltrami operator. And this delta D, this is just the average of these Laplace Beltrami operators uh, over the time interval you're interested in. And notice that the while the metric changes, the manifold remains fixed. The manifold is always at the initial time. Okay, so to now begin the process of relaxing materiality, I'm going to time expand my phase space. And I'm going to give each of these Riemannian manifolds that I just talked about its own T fiber. So I uh, imagine time, let's say time goes this way and I have these time slices. So I have many copies of space. And uh, topologically, this is simply uh, the interval across my manifold. And so I'll call that uh, bold M naught. Now in this space in M naught, a trajectory beginning at X naught, that would simply be a, a horizontal line. So that would simply be you fix X naught and then you run T from zero to tau. So it's just a straight line. So that's very simple. Now, what, what you normally think of, or perhaps normally think of as time expanded phase space is this co-evolved space time manifold where the teeth uh, fiber is, uh, the teeth element is crossed with phi TM. So in this space, a trajectory is what you might usually think of. You have the time coordinate here, and then the space coordinate is the, the flow forward for T time units of, of the initial condition. Okay. If you want to go between these spaces, then you have this simple canonical mapping. You just uh, map uh, Tx to T phi Tx. Okay, so you, this is diffeomorphism. You can go back and forth, no problem. Here, here's a picture of what I just talked about. So um, this is your original manifold. It's just one dimension. I mean, just for pictures, it's one dimensional. And the A here is my, let's say it's a Pignerin set. So to construct the M naught, we just take this and we just trivially copy across in time. So time is left to right. So trajectories just go as straight lines from left to right. The coherent set is just copied left to right. Now, if we apply phi, if we co-evolve this, then it, instead of having uh, T cross A, we have instead T cross phi T A. And so you, each of these vertical fibers is evolved by phi T and you get some nonlinear evolution. That's when you have a coherent set existing for the whole flow time. But we're interested in this situation where in this picture, nothing much happened. You're say mixing and then some coherent set appears grows uh, and then decays and dies and then goes away. And the co-evolved picture would look like this. Okay, so this is, this is what we, we want to pick up something like this. Uh, right, so this delta D, this is an operator on M. And what we want is an operator on our time expanded bold M naught. And so, well, the obvious thing to do is you apply this delta GT to the teeth copy of M. So the, on the teeth fiber. And uh, well, we do this, uh, but uh, we also need some um, connection in the time direction. So we're going to apply diffusion, uh, like a one dimensional, I guess, uh, Laplace operator in the, in the time direction. And this, this is going to control how much we relax the materiality. Uh, so in summary, we have this Laplace Beltrami operator on bold M naught, uh, GA, big GA is a metric on uh, bold M naught. And uh, explicitly this delta GA uh, has the following construction because we have this decomposition um, into space and time. If we apply delta GA to the teeth time fiber of uh, F, then what we do is uh, simply, well, we have diffusion with parameter A squared in the time direction. And then on the teeth time fiber, we spatially diffuse according to Laplace GT on that particular time fiber. 
And so this defines what we call the inflated dynamic Laplace operator because we've we've taken the dynamic Laplace operator, which averaged all these things, and now we've inflated it out to to separate out all the time finders, and we've added a, a time diffusion. Uh, now we're interested in eigenfunctions of this operator, and some of them are easy to identify. If you have a function that has no spatial dependence, so it's constant in space, then this term is zero, and you're left with just a simple 1D uh, heat equation. And um, because we're going to use Neumann uh, boundary conditions on the time faces, that's my footnote here, uh, the, the, um, the eigenfunctions are just going to be cosines. So the, the, the k here is the order of the eigenfunction, the a is our parameter, temp is for temporal eigenfunction. And so this is cosine a k pi t on tau. t is the time fiber, tau is the flow time, k is the index, a is the parameter. And we know what the eigenvalues are, um, they are here. Okay, so that's just an easy twice differentiation of this. So we call these temporal eigenfunctions and they don't tell us anything about coherent sets. Uh, we can bundle them all together. We can take linear combinations and take a, take a closure, and um, that'll give us this infinite dimensional eigenspace as 10. And what we want is the rest. So we take the orthogonal complement of S10, and that gives us a space S fat, which is the spatial eigenfunctions, and they are the ones that we're interested in. Okay, so here's a theorem. Uh, we this this is linking the the eigenvalues of this inflated dynamic Laplace in with the original dynamic Laplace. In. So the little lambdas are from the original one, and the big lambdas are from the uh, the inflated one. So for each k in each parameter a, you have this uh, inequality. So the the dynamical the kth dynamic Laplace eigenvalue is less than or equal to the kth spatial inflated dynamic Laplace eigenvalue. Now remember these are negative, so what this says is that the capital lambda is less negative than the lambda. One way of thinking about this is that the, 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 the eigenfunctions undergo more spatial mixing, if you like, um, under the true, under the dynamic Laplacian than this, than this slightly relaxed inflated dynamic Laplacian. It's a little hard to, that's the best I can do at the moment. Um, now, as you increase A, these both get more negative. And as you send A to infinity, then you blast all the temporal ones to minus infinity. So they all, they all get shoved down to minus infinity. As you send A to infinity, the spatial ones don't go to minus infinity. They converge to the case. So the case spatial one, that converges to the case uh, eigenvalue of the original dynamic Laplacian. And uh, this is, I mean, effective, well, I'll say a bit more about this soon, but this, this is a very nice result because essentially in this A goes to infinity limit, the inflated dynamic Laplacian converges in some senses to the original dynamic Laplacian. So we can think of, um, if we think of this as generating a diffusion process, then the parameter A corresponds to the strength of diffusion in, in time or the time coordinate. And as you diffuse stronger, more and more in the time coordinate, the different time fibers get increasingly connected. And this forces the spatial eigenfunctions to become increasingly constant in the time direction. Because if there's any variation in the time direction, for very large A, you'll get massively penalized when you start taking two derivatives. So these, these limiting constant in time eigenfunctions turn out to be in the limit just time copied versions of the eigenfunctions of these of the standard dynamic Laplacian. So that, that is a bit more behind this, uh, this last result here, this convergence result. So you can think of A as a tuning parameter. It interpolates between completely non-material coherent sets when A is zero and fully material coherent sets when A is infinity. Uh, and in a slightly unrelated, but not completely unrelated point, um, the local coordinate representation for this metric is, is what you see here. So it's what we had before for the little GTs. And then we tack on uh, in diagonal form this uh, one on A squared in the time direction. So you can see as you send A to infinity, the distance in the time direction goes to zero because it's very easy to get from one time place to another because you're diffusing so strongly. 
Uh, okay, so here's, here's an example. So I've got 400 points, uh, so 400 trajectories, and here's a dynamical system on a torus. And for a quarter of the time, we have some coherence, and for the other three quarters, there is no coherence. And I want to be able to pick that up from this information. So uh, what is my system? I'm using the, the Childress salad flow. So uh, this is a, the velocity field is uh, given here. So A is a parameter, obviously just controlling the speed of the, of the flow. And um, the stream function is uh, psi r. It depends on a parameter r that goes between minus one and one. When you choose r to be zero, the stream function looks like this and you get four vortices. And when r is plus or minus one, you get a diagonal shear uh, depending on whether you're plus one or minus one. And in between zero and plus minus one, you get some kind of cat's eye structure. So, so what I did here is I begin like this, uh, but then I, at some point in time, I switch from r being zero to r being plus or minus one. And I alternate uh, between these in a way that uh, creates a strong and mixing um, uh, flow. Now, uh, for I won't say a lot on computation, uh, just that uh, this is, we're using the finite element method uh, that was built um, for the dynamic Laplace operator. So this so-called adaptive transfer operator approach in this paper. Um, what you do is you mesh the location of trajectories at each time instant. So if I go back to my movie, what, here I have 50 frames. Uh, you could use 50 frames or you could use fewer, it probably wouldn't matter too much. Um, and you, you mesh, simply mesh the positions of the points. And um, using that mesh, you do the usual finite element stuff. So this eigen problem, delta df is lambda f, that becomes a discrete um, <clears throat> generalized eigenvalue problem with a stiffness matrix, so stiffness matrices for each time uh, step and um, mass matrices for each time step. The code for doing this mes uh, meshing is uh, at this GitHub site. Run by Oliver Junger, and um, to to okay. So we already have this. We can already do all this very quickly. And to get the inflated dynamic Laplacian now on time expanded space, uh, all we have to do is linearly interpolate these matrices across the time dimension. And to do that interpolation, you need some coefficients. But the coefficients are fixed. They're just some numbers. And um, this is derived. These numbers and the derivation is included in, in this paper, which is what I'm talking about here. Uh, okay, so some results. Um, here's the spectrum of my inflated dynamic Laplacian. You have a spatial eigenvalue at zero, that's by default because we're mass conserving. Then you have two temporal eigenvalues. Then you've got another three spatial ones, then you have a gap. So if you look just at the spatial ones because they're the interesting ones, you have four and then a gap. So uh, we imagine we might have four coherent sets. This is this is probably pretty likely because it's a decent gap. So we take these three non-trivial ones and in the plot on the right, I'm plotting the spatial uh, norm, so uh, versus time. Okay, so here's time. Time runs from minus one to one. That's my, that's my zero, I guess it's not zero tau, it's minus one to one. And um, here, this dotted line is where I turn on the mixing. So here I'm, I have the four vortices, here I turn on the mixing and I mix thereafter. And the y-axis is the spatial norm of uh, the time slice of the eigenfunction. And you can see all three eigenfunctions behave pretty much the same way. They uh, have non-trivial norm in the coherent region and they ha have uh, close to zero norm in the mixing region. So this will be one of the main ways that we will diagnose where you're coherent and where you're mixing by the size of this normal. Uh, here are some pictures. So um, this is at time minus one. This is right at the beginning of the flow. This is at time minus 0.5. That's exactly at the point where the, I turn on the mixing, I just, where I stop the coherence and start the mixing. And minus 0.4 is a little bit into the mixing. And this is the second, third, and fourth uh, spatial eigenfunction. So you, you see you get this up-down separation, left-right separation, and uh, here yet another separation. Uh, if you if you if you want to separate all the four things, then you can combine these three with the constant function, which is the 
zeroth eigenvalue. And you can plug this into uh, SIBA, which will separate for you automatically uh, by finding a sparse basis, these, these four sets. Uh, so I guess what I want you to see from this picture is you, you have quite strong norm here, and then the norm is gradually fading and then starts to rapidly fade as you enter the mixing region. These pictures are on M1, oh, I'm sorry, on M0, where trajectories are just straight lines. Here are the pictures in the co-evolved space. So now trajectories are really moving, uh, but because we're coherent, so because these are just uh, going around and around, after flow time of 0.5, the eigenfunction still looks the same. Uh, but then if you move a little bit further, you then start to mix, okay? So this is demonstrating that you, you're coherent here, but then a little bit further, you, you're mixing. The color here is not fading on purpose. I'm coloring everything according to the, to the magnitude here. So that's, I'm not illustrating the fade out here. Uh, here are some movies. So on the bottom, I've got actual, the actual data or trajectories. This is the M0 picture where trajectories are just straight lines, I guess, into the, into the screen. And uh, in this, this is the co-evolved space. So you will see you have this coherent behavior and then when you start to mix, you're, you're gone. So in the beginning, you're there and then now you're gone when you start to mix. At the top, you have the corresponding thing for the eigenfunctions. So here you're just proceeding in straight lines. And here you, again, in the beginning, you were there. And when you, as soon as you start mixing, you fade out. And here's yet another view where this is time. Um, this, is, uh, this is space. I'm plotting again, just the second eigenfunction. You see trajectories are going around and around in these vortices. When you get to minus 0.5, uh, then you see you start to get uh, blue and red, blue in the top and red in the bottom. And pretty soon thereafter, you, you fade out. So this seems to work uh, pretty nicely. Uh, actually, this is my last slide. So actually, there's, uh, I can't possibly talk about everything in this paper. There's uh, quite a few different uh, things we put in there. Uh, regarding geometry, uh, in this paper, uh, we talked about uh, dynamic uh, Cheeger and Sobolev uh, constants, which tell you about the, the size of the boundary of your coherent sets and tell you about uh, the, the geometry. And uh, in the same paper that I'm talking about here, uh, we introduce inflated versions of these and we prove a theorem, like my eigenvalue theorem that relates the two. And this really formalizes the regularity of the boundary of these semi-material coherent sets so that you can see then formally there's a trade-off between boundary size and materiality. More material means your set is gonna be more irregular. Um, and then this, this parameter A will interpolate one way or the other. Uh, we also look at SDEs that are generated by this inflated dynamic Laplacian on the pullback space and the co-evolved space. And we show that as you send A to infinity, you recover the process generated by the dynamic Laplacian. So this uses uh, averaging, averaging techniques uh, because as you increase A, the, the time becomes the fast process and the space becomes the slow process and you can use averaging to, to show this. Uh, and finally, we, we collapse the spatial dimensions to make just a one-dimensional ODE in time, which it turns out to be a sturm liouville ODE. And this gives us finer information on the spatial norms of the eigenfunction. So what I'm talking about here is this picture. So we can describe pretty precisely this behavior using uh, this uh, 1D uh, ODE. And, uh, and also using the same uh, ODE, we can quantify the instantaneous mixing, uh, instant in time experienced by the eigenfunction. And we can therefore identify time intervals when mixing is more than or less than average. And so this is also leading into how do you tell when you're coherent and when do you tell when, when you're not coherent? Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Robert Mac here, yeah. Hi Gary, yeah, nice talk. Um, on the first part, I wanted to know how your method handles cases where maybe cycles don't have, uh, have where the cycles have variable period. Um, what kind in of reality, cycle would that be? <laughs> right, in reality, you know, it might be 
four years or three years or five years or four and a half or what sorts of things? Well, I, yeah, I guess Enzo is a little like that. Um, I mean, there. I, I don't know how much you would uh, call it. A, so you're saying it's like a it's a variable period cycle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, obviously, what I've presented here is not going to uh, capture that out of the box because uh, mm -hmm. we 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 have a single uh, eigenvalue and that is determining a fixed uh, period. Um, do, do, do you have some uh, problem in mind that uh, that does this sort of thing? Well, Enso is an example, I think. But the but the question is, can you take another eigenfunction that would detect this variation in the period? I think I think this is going in the direction of these these combination cycles. So um, there are there are flavors mm -hmm. of Enso, um, as you probably know. So um, it, it would be nice to, what, what we tried to do in this paper a little bit, uh, I think uh, we don't fully answer that question, but we tried to, uh, in a pre preliminary way, explain these flavors of Enzo by combination modes. So um, by combining these longer trends, sorry, not longer trends, longer cycles like uh, semi-annual and triennial with the, with the Enzo. So, um, mm -hmm. Uh, we we do have some uh, yeah I, I guess it's what what, you, what you're doing is modulating you, you have the Enzo you have the pure Enzo which has this approximately four year period and then you're you're modulating it by combining it with uh, some longer like uh, decadal yeah. Um, modulation yeah. yeah so so we do have some preliminary things in the paper on that okay and uh, even in the Lorentz system the the time it takes to go around depends on uh which trajectory and furthermore if you broke the symmetry then you could make a radically different amount of time it takes to go around the left and the right that's an interesting experiment so if the symmetry were broken then i would expect to get two distinct eigenvalues and i guess uh, i would expect a projection on you know one wing a projection on one wing or a projection on the other wing um, mm. but uh yeah the uh where did I have this here? So uh, actually, uh, if you if you run a long, this picture is looking a little uh, too nice because I only ran here like um, ten units of time. But uh, if you run this longer, it tends to fill out a little bit uh, fatter. And if you really then say, okay, I want to restrict to the to the peripheral part, then what you see is the peripheral part is really the part around here where you do simply just cycle around and around. And then the, the part that is not so well, that is near, near the center of it, uh, that corresponds to where you're getting injected in, you know, where you're meeting the stable manifold and you're, you're separating either this way or this way. So all this stuff around the outside, that is not so cyclic. And all the stuff up through the stable manifold here is also not so cyclic. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question, if I may ask, for the second part of the talk. Um, how in practice um, you showed these um, eigenvalues and you said uh, some of them are temporal and some are spatial. How can you distinguish them in practice by looking at the eigenfunction? Is that the trick? Because um, This is a very good question. <laughs> uh, and I have a good answer for it too. <laughs> so okay. I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't talk about this, but um, so you can show that, I mean, by theory, the, um, the spatial eigenfunction should have uh, zero mean. So oh, okay. me meaning if you take a particular time slice and you integrate on that time slice, you should get zero. So what we do is we calculate these means and then we compute something like, I think we compute just the variance of the means. And so uh, that should be pretty close to zero for the spatial ones. And the temporal ones, because they're basically cosines, the, there's an analytic formula for uh, what the variance of the mean should be. And so if you normalize, you can make this sort of zero one rule, where if you're near one, you're temporal, and if you're near zero, then you're spatial. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need to look at them, fortunately. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. All right. Other questions?
Yeah, all right. So it seems that there are no other questions. Okay, thank you very much so again for the nice talk. So uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.